there's one thing I love, it's community. But I didn't always know that. I felt it first when I arrived at a university campus of 40,000 students. I felt like a mere decimal point, a statistic. I felt like such a small part of a whole. And I wondered, will I ever feel like I belong here? That was the first time I realized that being a part of something that was bigger than myself was important to me. And then 2004 came. And with it came Facebook, an online platform that began rolling out to US universities gradually. But to sign up, you had to use your university email to verify your identity. And up until that point, I had only ever used nicknames online. So being online as the real me felt strange at first. But I quickly forgot about it as I became friends with people from classes, people I worked with, and eventually my friends around the world as Facebook became available to the public. It swallowed that vastness of the campus, that enormity of the world, and it made it so small. Thinking about it now, I realize that there's a version of the last 15 years of my life online. A virtual life that at first seemed to run in parallel with my real life. But as I find myself remembering specific moments as I experience them through technology, conversations and comment threads I had with people online, like clear memories, I'm not so sure. For instance, I remember in 2009, I was sitting on my couch with my laptop, I had Twitter open, and suddenly I noticed that out of the blue, Patrick Swayze was trending. And people were reporting, were tweeting about his death based on unnamed sources and rumors, falsely. And I remember that moment very, very clearly, because I remember feeling so skeptical. It was the first time that some, kind of, some piece of news was trending, and I just I couldn't verify it on any of the traditional news media outlets. It feels like yesterday, when I felt the strong grip of community in Cyprus' recent darkest moments during the 2013 economic crisis, when I realized just how many people were sharing their stories online, were sharing news stories from journalists in Brussels, they were posting updates and photos from ATM queues around the island. There used to be a clear distinction between us and the media. But today, we are the media too. We also have a loudspeaker. And what we choose to share and how we use that space, it really matters. It mattered for the Middle Eastern citizens that used it to protest against oppressive regimes. It mattered for the waves of women that used the hashtag MeToo and made their voices heard. It mattered in the US election when people shared falsified stories about candidates. It mattered in the UK referendum when people shared sensationalized stories that contributed to a majority leave vote. But all communities have their inherent biases. My community thinks like me. I expect that it will react like me. It will approve what I say. And you know, actually, that kind of makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I belong there. And social media platforms know this. And they respond to this by providing us with content that is catered to us. The content we see is the one that's most meaningful to us. And this is true on social media platforms as well as search engines. But who decides what's meaningful? Every like, share, comment we make matters. It determines what we most engage with, what is most important to us, what we respond to. Online, we inhabit rooms full of people telling the kinds of stories we like to hear, the kinds of stories that we are likely to repeat, applaud, and celebrate. 
our news feeds become small rooms, very much like this one, full of people eager to echo exactly what it is we're saying. Social media gives us a very different version of reality. It gives us the version of reality that we most prefer. It makes us blind to our own biases. I used to work as a secondary school teacher, and I introduced a media studies course in the curriculum for upper high school students. And I remember going into that first media studies class, I knew that this course was oversubscribed for a reason. Everyone thought that we would be watching YouTube videos all day. And actually, they were partly right. I made sure that together we consumed as much diverse media as possible. And in order to do that, I created a closed Facebook group where we could share what appeared on our news feeds, what was trending, or what we weren't sure about. That became the space where students, both current and former, got together to discuss, dissect, critique, or even mock the media. It became one of the most important and valued communities that I am a part of. Of course, on that first day of class, I didn't know that. Nor did I know that I would end up talking about my students' reaction to the term media literacy for years to come. I remember when I said the words media literacy, my students looked at me with eyes that seemed to say, media what? But that what matters the most. We read media. We imitate media. But do we speak media? In a world made up of binary oppositions, that seems to me to be the most critical thing. We have control of our privacy settings, but we have no privacy. We navigate a world made up of true versus fake news stories. We have a voice, but algorithms that determine the content we see render us voiceless. So have social media failed us? Or are we failing on social media? Is the, is the answer to quit social media altogether? Well, that's one option, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. In fact, there isn't one single action that solves this problem. But there is one thing that we can all do. But it's small. It's not enough, but it's a start. If we choose to stay on social media, we need to be more critical as we're scrolling through our news feeds. We need to ask the what more often. We need to question what we see and why we see it. Next time you see sponsored content, ask yourself, what? Next time you read a headline that angers, shocks, or enthralls you, ask yourself, what? Next time a video starts playing, ask yourself, what? Next time you see a photo or a meme that's getting a lot of shares, ask yourself, what? As you're scrolling through what your friends are sharing, ask yourself, is it opinion, news? Is it based on fact, speculation? What? Next time you hear that haunting ping of your notifications and pick up your phone, and mindlessly make your way down whatever social media rabbit hole, be alert, be conscious, ask the simple question first. What is it? The what isn't going to get you very far, but it's going to lead to the harder questions like, who is behind this post? How is it constructed to appeal to me? And why am I seeing this? Asking the what seems small. It's not enough, but it's a start. As a media educator, my students often tell me that I've ruined their media lives. And you know, I take that as a compliment. 
because I know that they can never passively consume another media product without thinking about it critically. I joined social media platforms looking for community, and I found it. But in many ways, I'm nothing more than a statistic, a fraction of a number that's so small, it's enough to make me feel quite seriously meaningless. I am not meaningless. You are not meaningless. Together, we can all be very meaningful. Our actions online impact our daily lives. What we share can create ripples, and those ripples can bring change. That change can be good or bad, but it's only when we start thinking about what we consume that we get to make that choice. Thank you.